righty. Well, somebody say hallelujah. Thank you, Josh, for leading us into the presence. Uh, just want to testify, last week's uh, 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 motorcycle ride was uh, uh, a sign of God moving miraculously against the will of the people. Um, the, well, the ride did not go well from the start. And uh, uh, slowly, as two motorcycles would not start, uh, one motorcycle wound up uh, needing a clutch adjustment that we, or, or choke adjustment that we could not do. Uh, uh, my motorcycle had an uh, oil light. Uh, and finally, in the end, uh, uh, Jose's bike went flat. We were wondering, wow, we had all these plans of great fellowship and riding around the island. That didn't work out. Turns out two things. Number one, Jose's tire was not flat but had been slashed. And had we driven up the H3 like we had originally planned, it could have gone flat. He could have crashed and died. Two, my oil light was a result of a recall that has caused two crashes already that causes the oil line to break under high revs uh, and pour oil out onto the road right in front of the rear tire, which causes the bike to wash out. And so there's two crashes uh, uh, reported already. And had we gone on H3 like we, well, like we thought, I would have revved it high and that thing might have burst and poured oil not only in front of my rear wheel, but everybody behind me would have ridden through that huge oil slick because it blasts all the oil of the engine out at once, <laughs> covering the road. And so the Lord knew all this. And sometimes when things are going wrong and we think to ourselves, man, you know, Lord, where's your blessing? The blessing is in the wrong. Yep. Because he is trying to prevent something else. Somebody say amen. amen. It's yeah, like, like Romans 8.28 says, all things work together for good. For those who love Jesus and are called according to his purpose. You know, Kella, sometimes it is so weird. It's, it's like the Bible is actually true. It's so bizarre. Anyway, just in the way of announcements, we will be here Wednesday night for Bible study, but next Sunday, there will be no, oh, oh, and uh, Saturday, there's going to be some kind of girl thing, and then, um, what time does it start? 9 a.m.? Okay, 9 a.m. girls thing, and then, um, what? Women's Fellowship, yeah. Okay, then um, on Sunday... Um, there's no Sunday morning service, not an 8.30, not a 10, because next week Sunday is when we are going to have our joint worship service with Life Church. They're coming down the street. They are three blocks up the road. Uh, formerly, uh, uh, Adrian Ewan, friend of mine, pastored his highest praise. Now it's Life Church. Uh, uh, apostle Greg Hood. The reason, by the way, his title is Apostle is because he's the presiding bishop over the entire uh, Pentecostal Holiness Conference. He has churches that he presides over, not only here in Hawaii, but in the Philippines, and in California, and in Oregon, and in Washington. So that's why his title is what it is. Uh, but nonetheless, his, his church and his people will be joining us on Sunday evening at 5. Uh, we're going to be having a worship time together. Greg and I are going to joint preach, uh, team preach a message. And then uh, we're all going to go outside. Actually, we're going to have a bl blend because we've got too many people. So some will be outside, some will be in here, uh, and we're going to be having fried chicken, and we're going to be having barbecued uh, pork uh, sticklets and uh, all kinds of good stuff. And anyway, if you want to volunteer to help, uh, just check with Matt, and he will plug you in because we could use a hand or two. And actually, I forgot I'm supposed to call Greg and ask him how many guys could help for cooking during service. So I, my bad, not yours. I will get on that. Anything else I need to announce? No. Okay, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we look to you to speak to us this morning. We look to you in the midst of trial for some of us. Some of us are going through hard things. We felt we were going through a tough thing on Sunday last week. During that ride, things were not going right. I had a hard week this week, watching a friend of mine pass away right in front of my eyes. There are times, Lord, when we feel as though, maybe I got it wrong, maybe I made the wrong call. 
Maybe I'm not where you want me to be because things are not going well. In fact, they're tanking. Maybe I missed what you were trying to say. Help to ally our fears and give us comfort and strength and replaced hope and trust. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. amen. Okay, I want you to turn uh, to Mark chapter 6. And in Mark chapter 6, we're going to take a look at something we have looked at before. Mark chapter 6, and the same, uh, another version of it is found in Matthew 14. And that is storm. Jesus, in this case, purposely, somebody say purposely, purposely sends his apostles into a storm. He knows that utilizing their natural resource of strength and ingenuity and teamwork, they will not be able to succeed in doing what he has told them to. He knows this. He tells them, he makes, in fact, the Bible says, he makes them get into the boat without him. They don't want to, apparently they didn't want to get in the boat. As experienced fishermen, they wanted to tell him, this is not the right time of day. This is not the right circumstance under which we should be doing this. You know, as logicians, we sometimes see a situation, a project, or an event, and we will think to ourselves, this is not going to work. We should not be doing this. It does not add up, and yet there is something in there, either a word of prophetic or, or just a commitment we've made, or just a feeling we have in our heart. This is something God wants, even though it doesn't look right. It doesn't look like it should be. So God, Jesus, purposely sends them into a storm. They may have thought, well, since Jesus is sending us, normally there is a storm at this time. Normally there is trouble and turbulence in the water. But since Jesus is sending us, that must mean that he's going to take care of it, and that must mean that everything will go well, even though regularly for most people's things uh, go catastrophically. And in fact, they do not. Jesus tells them to go across the lake to Bethsaida, and they wind up caught in a storm. And many wonderful things happen through this, but to understand this, and something I call the riddle of Mark 6. We need to take a look at what happened beforehand. What was the precursor to everything that's happening here? Okay. In Mark 4, which is two chapters before, and in Matthew 12, is it? Eight. Mark 4, that's right, 4, 8. In Mark 4 and Matthew 8, we see another storm. This is the one where Jesus is not with them. This is the storm. Some theologians believe these are two different storms. Uh, but frankly, for the purpose of this message, it doesn't matter if it's two different storms or one. Um, the plain fact of the matter is, this one is found in Mark 4, and this one is found in Mark 8. And so... These, this storm happens before this storm does. In other words, the apostles had been through a storm with Jesus before. Now in the Mark 4, Matthew 8 version, he is asleep in the boat and they have to wake him. Because Jesus is so calm in the midst of the storm. You ever seen people that are like that in the midst of a storm? They're just very calm and they're very happy and you think they're stupid and you feel like slapping the dumb grin off their face and they're just like, Jesus is going to take care of it. I'm not worried. I'm not concerned. Yeah, but you're losing all your money. Yeah, but you're losing your health. Yeah, but you're losing this. Yeah, but you're losing that. And they're just this. They're not grousing. 
Now, see, the opposite way of doing this, this is a, this is a bad Christian, this is a bad Christian witness, is when things go wrong and things are not going your way, you just grumble all the time. You get negative. You get critical of everything. Your hope goes. Your trust goes. You don't love God. You don't love anybody. And it looks to everybody who looks at you like you are just dragging yourself through life just because you simply have to. And you can't wait to die because this life's so awful. Okay, not only is that a horrible witness, but that's the opposite of what Jesus is trying to teach. Here, Jesus is trying to show them something. In the middle of this storm, he's sleeping. They've got to wake him up and tell him, Lord, we're dying. We're going to sink. And he looks at them and says, you have little faith. And he stands up, puts his hand up and says, peace be still, speaks to the storm. And the whole storm goes calm. point I'm trying to make is this. The apostles have been through this. They have experienced a storm before only this time Jesus is not with them that's the big difference Jesus according to this narrative and this narrative is up on a mountainside where he has gone to pray and he is watching them he is not physically with them but in spirit he is because he is observing where they are now I gotta tell you something the Bible says that they are in the middle of the lake this is at night time. Uh, 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 in fact, we're about to see that Jesus is going to walk out there to go, go, go tend to them. And this is like around 3 to 6 in the morning that he goes out there. So in the middle of the night, he is watching them. So I don't know what kind of eyes Jesus has. Pretty good. Because it is night time. He is on a mountaintop looking in the middle of a lake at a boat that is four miles away. Now, I don't know about you, but when a boat goes out in Kaneohe Bay and it's four miles out, I can't see the thing anymore. Certainly not at night in a storm. But Jesus, and the, the whole point is this, Jesus could see them. Jesus was aware of what they were going through. Jesus knew that they were straining at the oars. They'd been through a storm before. There were two other things that happened that in the framework of Mark 6, which is sometimes referred to as the sending. Because most disciples see that there is a common thread in Mark 6 that is all predicated upon the process of Jesus sending his apostles out to do something. At the beginning of Mark 6, what we see is this. And take a look with me. Verse 7, he summoned the twelve and began to send them out. Say that with me. Send them out. One more time. Send them out in pairs. Now look, if I'm walking and hanging and banging with Jesus... And he is right there, and he says, okay, I want to send you out with Joshua. Love Joshua, love adventure, but Jesus is here. I want to stay with him. I want to talk with him. I want to walk with him. I want to be with him. I just want to stay with him. But Jesus' purpose is this, to not remain in this tight, cloistered little group, not constantly have you right underneath here where everywhere I go, you go, but to partner with you in the conversion of these people and the blessing of this nation of Israel through the preaching of the good message by sending you guys out. I'm going to send out Jessica and Kelly. I'm going to send out Dave and Cheryl. I'm going to send out Matt and Josh. I'm going to send out Gabby and, and Mike. I'm going to send them out. Sent out someplace where you don't necessarily want to go. You don't necessarily feel prepared to go. How prepared do you think they thought they were to go out without Jesus? And yet it says, He gave them authority over the unclean spirits. In the Matthew 10, uh, chapter, uh, verse 1 version uh, of this rendition, you'll see that He also gave them authority over sickness and disease. He says, Any place that doesn't take you in or listen to you, shake the dust off your feet and move on. And in verse 12, it says, then they went out. They did what Jesus said. 
and preached that men should repent. And they were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. So sent, number one, at the beginning of Mark 6. Sent. So we know this also. Not only had the apostles been through a storm with Jesus and seen his miracle working power, but they have just been through for the past few weeks this process of being sent out, casting out demons, healing the sick, and preaching the good news to everybody. The kingdom of God is at hand. So the whole theory seems to be do what I do and do what I say. I want you, Jesus is teaching his apostles, to emulate me. Whether I'm physically with you or not, I want you to emulate me. Whether I'm physically with you or not, I want you saying the things that I would say. Doing the things that I would do. Treating people the way I would treat them. Responding to situations and circumstances the way I would. I want you to emulate me. And I'm sending you out to do that. Third, in, Ma in, in, in Mark 6, verse 33, they have 5,000 men that they have been preaching to all day long. The people saw them going, verse 33, and many recognized them and ran together on foot from all the cities and got there ahead of them. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd and felt compassion upon them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. That means it was a long sermon, kind of like mine. When it was quite late, look at verse 35, because this is what gives us context to understand what was happening here in the storm. It says in verse 35, when it was already quite late, Usually this means past dinner time. Usually this means the day has ended and the next day has come because that happens at sundown. Already quite late, his disciples came to him and said, this place is desolate and already quite late. So the quite late thing gets repeated. Send them away so that they may go into the surrounding countryside and villages to buy themselves something to eat. Now, Yuko, what was happening here? It was late. It's near sundown or past sundown. They see that the people are tired and hungry, and quite frankly, at this stage, the apostles themselves are tired and hungry. We need rest. We need R&R. &R. I am done. Believe me, I've been pastoring for 40 years now, and I understand getting to the stage, even in ministry, of going, I am so done. I am so over this. That's the way we say it today. In the old days, we used to just say, I quit. Take this job and do something with it. I started talking and suddenly realized I couldn't complete that one. And it was desolate. It says it was a desolate place. That means it was far from support. It's not like they were right next to a 7-Eleven. These people were all stuck out there. And the apostles can see it coming. There's a disaster coming. Something is going to happen. You got 5,000 men. Who knows how many women? Who knows how many children? It doesn't stipulate, but 5,000 men. And we got them all out here with no porta potties, with no water fountains, with no water, with no food, with nothing. And it's late, and there's no shelter, and this was really poorly planned, and this was not administrated correctly. And so now you, Jesus, have got to send them all on their own to take care of themselves. But he answered them. Verse 37, look at this, horrible. What is Jesus' answer to the conundrum of all these people? But he answers them and says, you give them something to eat. Oh, well, fine. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. And so often with us, when we are in ministry, that's exactly what we hear. Disasters happening everywhere, and now all of a sudden, God is saying to us, you take care of it. Handle it. Just take care of it. And, he, and, and they said to him, they answer him, shall we spend 200 denarii and buy bread for all these people? I don't have the money. 
I don't have, and basically, I don't have the money as code for, I don't have the energy, I don't have the time, I don't have the will, I don't have the want, I don't want to do this, I don't have the resource for it. The bread is far from here. It's desolate. Remember, I just told you it's desolate. Even if we had the money, that means me and Kella got to go all the way to Costco and buy the stupid stuff and drive it back. By then, everybody's going to get ticked off and this is not working well. They didn't want to be bothered with the problem. They felt that they had done enough. Ever feel like that? I paid my dues. I paid my price. I've given up enough stuff for this deal. And now God is asking for even more. Cost was basically too great in their opinion. Verse 38, he says to them, okay, how many loaves do you have? Go look. So he's talking to all 12, right? So all 12 go to their stash. 12 guys. How well did they plan? 12 guys plus Jesus. You had a 12 plus 1 situation at the very least. Don't know if Mary Magdalene and the whole bunch of women were there with them or not. But there they are on the side. And what did they bring with them, Matt? Five loaves and two fish. Between all 12 of them, this is all they've got. Okay? So we're out here in this desolate place. It's getting really, really late. And, and how much does the worship team have with it? I got two, uh, I got two oatmeal bars. And I got a jar of, uh, what is that stuff you drink? That green tea, Edo N stuff. Yeah? We got one bottle of Edo N. We got, two or, uh, we got two oatmeal bars. And we got a piece of, uh, we got a Slim Jim that um, Kel has had in his pocket for the last two weeks. Yeah, and this is it. Five loaves, they said, and two fish. But this is what happens. Jesus takes it. He blesses it, and he says, pass it out. And they see a miracle, kind of like Elijah's cruise of oil and flour that never stopped. They just keep giving it and giving it and giving it. And Jesus is multiplying, or the power of God is multiplying the food. And they wind up feeding everybody with the Slim Jims and the oatmeal bars. And the Ito N. 1 Kings 17, 16. That happens to Elijah when the cruise of oil and flour do not run out. The point I'm trying to make is this. The answer to... The storm found in Mark 4 and Matthew 8 was the miracle working power of God. The apostles had gotten to the end termination point of what they could do. And they felt they were going to drown. And Jesus shows them when you get to that point, and you have to be willing to get yourself to that point, you cannot tell him, Lord, we're going to perish before you get in the boat. While the, still, while the sea is still calm, you cannot tell him, the waves are overcoming us, we're going to drown. You have to be in there, hanging in there, and trying to do God's will to the point where now you really will drown if something does not happen. In the case of the second, how can a human man cast out a demon? How can we heal sickness? There was no longs back there they did not have access to medication all they had was a laying on of hands and saying in the name of Jesus be healed that's all they had casting out demons you can't even see the stupid thing it talks sometimes through somebody I've had that happen to me but it is the authority of the name of Jesus and the miracle working power of God that achieves what is necessary in this case to cast out demons and heal the sick and preach the good news. Three, multiplying food. You got to be willing to go out there. You got to be willing to listen to Jesus. You got to be willing to let him talk as long as he wants to. And you have to be willing to cough up everything you've got. Five loaves and two fish may not sound like a lot, but it's all they had. And Jesus said, cough it up. And it is this last little bit that you have that you are counting on to sustain you in these last moments before you faint from starvation have this big day of ministry. Cough this up, give it up to me, and this is the part that I will use. 
It is not the abundant part that they had before. It was that last little tidbit of five loaves and two fish that Jesus winds up blessing and Jesus winds up using. He gets you to the absolute back, of, your back is to the wall stage where he has 5,000 real hungry people and five loaves and two fish of real food and that's it. And a miracle must happen. Now, In Mark chapter 4, where that storm occurs, at the end of it, in verse 41, the apostles ask a question when they see Jesus calm the storm. They say, who is this? Who is this that can speak to the storm and have it go flat? QV41, question on verse 41. QV41 is, who is this guy? And in response to that, over the next two chapters, Jesus shows them, I am the one who speaks to a storm and calms it. How familiar you are with uh, uh, a messianic prophecy? How many, of you are, how many of you are aware that this is the answer to a messianic prophecy? That this is something that Messiah is going to do. It's found in Psalm 107, verse 29 and 30. But what it says is Messiah is going to be the one who is going to speak to the storm and speak to the wind and speak to the waves and calm it. Now whether the apostles are that well read in Torah or not or, 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 the, or the Psalms or not, I don't know. But I do know this. I understand it. And for those who understand Old Testament prophecy, the second Jesus stands up and says, peace be still, and the sea goes down, wham, I know who this is. The second I see him sending out apostles and having the power to give them authority to cast out demons and them authority to heal the sick, and them authority to preach the good news and, and, and lead people to salvation. I know who this is. The second I see him multiplying food, I know who this is. second I see him walking on water, the second I see him making the lame to walk and the blind to see and the deaf to hear, the second I see him doing all these things, I know the answer to the question. And at the end of this version of this storm, after Peter is called to walk on the water, and by the way, I think Peter gets a bum rap for all that because everybody says, he got out of the water, and he's walking around, and then he gets afraid of the waves, and he gets afraid of the wind, he starts to sink, he says, Jesus, Lord, save me, and he does. Jesus does, comes right away, it says his hand, grab Peter immediately. And although there was a chiding for a lack of faith, Kali, I will tell you this. That out of all 12 of those disciples, there is only one, only one, only one who knows what it feels like to walk on water. And that's the one who got out. Yeah, he sank. Yeah, it didn't work out. But he knows what water under his feet for a few steps feels like as he is staring in Jesus and counting on, and focusing on Jesus. You can walk on water when you focus on Jesus and trust in Jesus. And at the end of that, in, Mark, in Matthew 14, verse 33, Peter says, Surely you are the Son of God. Surely. So what do we see here? We see a pattern in this Mark chapter 6 ascending. That Jesus is trying to answer this question for them. Who is this that calms the sea? He's the one who sends us with miraculous power. He's the one who multiplies food with miraculous power. He's the one who heals. He's the one who delivers. He's the one who 
causes mir miracles to happen. And now they're caught in a storm. Again. But they have been through all this. And they are there, and they are rowing against the wind, and they're rowing against the waves, and they're hanging in there as much as they can. And I want to highlight one thing for you before we give up on this, this, this passage. Take a look at verse 48. Matthew 6, 48. Jesus, seeing them straining at the oars, for the wind was against them, at about the fourth watch of the night, that's between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., just before dawn, he came to them walking on the sea. Look at this next line. He saw them straining, and he came to them on the sea, intending to do what? What does it say? It says... He came to them walking on the sea, and he intended to pass them by. He actually didn't want to do anything. He was hoping that seeing him on the water would remind them of what happened before. Call on the miraculous. He wants them to emulate him. Could it be one of two things? Either A, he wants them, okay, the boat's not moving, but look, I'm walking on the water. Maybe you guys all need to get out of the boat and walk on the water too. Could it be, Keller, that he wanted one of them at least to stand up in the middle of the boat and speak to the storm and say, peace, be still, and see the ocean go flat? Somewhere in there, Jesus wanted somebody to emulate him, to remember what they had gone through. Because what it says here in the end of this passage is this. Then he got, verse 51, then he got into the boat with them and the wind stopped and they were utterly astonished for they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves. Their heart was hardened. They were missing something. It wound up turning out the way it did because they missed something. They forgot something. They lost sight of something. And what was that something that they lost sight of? Sometimes called the riddle of the storm. What was it that they forgot? What was it that they forgot? What was it that they lost sight of in the midst of this storm, in the midst of the struggle? They forgot, number one, who it was that they served. When you are in the middle of a storm, I got to conclude, in the, when you find yourself in the middle of a storm, number one, never forget who it is that has called you. Who it is that has saved you. This is not some paltry idea, idea man out of S Silicon Valley. This is not some ideologue out of Washington. This is not some scientist out of Princeton or Harvard or Oxford who has figured something out that nobody else has. The one who saves you, the one who has called you, the one who fills you, and the one who is sending you out now to live your life of impact and transformation for other people is the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the creator of this universe. The God of gods and King of kings. It is He, Messiah Jesus, whom we serve. Two, understand that if you start doubting whether this is God's will because it's difficult and it's not going well, the whole point to the sending is he will push you. He will take you into storms on purpose to show you you are supposed to remain calm during these things because God has power over the miraculous. Let me say amen to that. If God has power over the miraculous, the point to the first part of Mark 6 is he sends you, he sends us, he sends we out there to do things and move into the miraculous. He will put us in situations where all of our natural resources, talents, and abilities will not be enough. Listen to me now. Look at me for a second. This is Jesus sending. But he will send you and he will send me into places where our natural abilities, our talents, and our skills, and our resources are insufficient, but he sends us anyway. It is still him that sent. 
Because as you mature in the Lord, what he wants to do is send you places where it will require you to rely on the miraculous. It is elementary basic to allow yourself to be put in a situation by God where if he fails to show up, I can still take care of it. What he wants to do is put you someplace where you are uncomfortable. Someplace where you are not trained, not educated, not financed, not prepared for this, but nonetheless is where he sends so that he can do the miraculous. And now here they are. And the storm is rising and they're, they're, they're rowing against the... And maybe in your life right now, you're rowing against the wind. You're rowing against the waves. You're not making any progress. You're not making any headway. And you're wondering, maybe I missed God somewhere. You did not. They forgot something. They forgot who they serve. They forgot he sends in order to do the miraculous. When you are at a place in your life where you are beyond your natural ability or resource, begin to call out for the miraculous. Begin to ask God for a bigger miracle than you think you deserve. A bigger miracle than you think can happen. My husband has left me in the name of Jesus. Bring him home, Lord. Do whatever it takes to bring him home. This person is breaking my marriage up. In the name of Jesus, Lord, remove that person from the situation. This thing is tempting one of the guys in my church away from church. In the name of Jesus, remove that thing. Take it away. I can't do anything about it. And the draw to it is too great. It's compromising his ministry. I know it is. But there's nothing I can do about that. As a pastor, I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, take that thing away. Remember who it is who has called you. Remember who it is you serve. Remember that he will push you as he did his apostles into difficult situations. But remember that anytime you find yourself in a situation like that that is beyond your abilities, beyond your talents, and beyond your resource, it is at that time that he wants you to remember these things. Remember that surely he is the Son of God who has given you his name and his authority and call out for the miraculous and see what will happen. With every head bowed and every head closed, let me pray for you. I want to encourage you this morning, especially those of you that are in a hard situation. All things work together for good for those who love Jesus and are called according to his purpose. Maybe it's time to call out for the miraculous. Maybe you can close your eyes right now and lift your hands and just whisper this prayer, Father, in the name of Jesus, I need a miracle. I need a miracle. What has to change? What's the problem? What needs to change? Tell them what that is. In the name of Jesus, remove this. In the name of Jesus, change this. In the name of Jesus, add this. In the name of Jesus, Lord, you know I'm at the end. But where I end, you begin. There are times in our life where we must become smaller that he may become greater. There's a time when we all must discover why my strength is made perfect in your weakness is true. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask that you would begin to release miracles in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. Thank you for listening. I'm sorry I went over time.